Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Richland County in Ohio, I was 15 or 16 at the time and running a trap line on a creek west and south of Adderio, Ohio. This was my third or fourth year of trapping. My dog Smokey always went with me and usually chased Rabbit while I was checking my traps. That morning, before going to school, I set out to check my traps with a near full moon lighting up the sky. It was a very cold morning. As I started down the Adario West Road toward the creek, Smokey started acting strange and wouldn't leave my side. He started growling, a real deep growl, just barely audible. At each spot where I had a trap set, Smokey would sit on top of the bank while I went to check my trap. I was nearing the end of my trap line when I had to go down a steep bank to retrieve a muskrat in one of my traps. This time, Smokey came down the bank with me and sat facing up the bank, his growling growing louder. I was just getting ready to reset the trap when an eerie feeling came over me. I turned to look up the bank. Smokey had ceased growling and was leaning against me and saw something I had never seen before until many years later in a documentary on Bigfoot. Whatever it was, stood approximately seven feet tall and was all covered with long hair except its face. The face was not exactly human but not animal either and there seemed to be some kind of foul odor in the air. Needless to say it scared me half to death but I think I also might have surprised it at the same time. In just seconds it turned and half walked half ran away. I started up the bank a few seconds later and reached the top of the bank in time to see it cross a six-foot-high grade leading into a field without even touching it. I watched it lumber through the field for a minute or so to make sure it wasn't going in the direction I had to go and then started for home. Unfortunately, there was no snow on the ground and the ground was frozen pretty hard. I didn't even think to look for tracks at the time, but thought about it in school later in the day. I decided to go back out and look for tracks after school, but as luck would have it, we got about four inches of snow before I got home from school. I didn't tell my parents or anyone else because I didn't want to lose my freedom to trap and I knew my mom would become unglued if she knew about it. I waited several days before checking my trap line again for fear of running into it again, but never did see anything like it again. There are a lot of small woodlots in this area, but nothing of any great size because it is farm country with roads as close as one mile apart. I have no idea where something like that could have lived undetected by someone sometime. I didn't find out until the early 90s that there had been any sightings of such a creature anywhere in Ohio. I thought such sightings were mostly in Northern California and up the coast states into Canada. Anyhow, that's about as much as I can remember after all these years. It was early morning before the sun came up, the weather was very cold, and it was almost a full moon in the sky. There was an empty field to the northeast, and a heavily wooded area directly to the south, a couple of hundred yards. It didn't seem to act hostile. On to the next one. At Mansfield in Richland County in Ohio, at Charles Mill Reservoir, Michael Lane, Wayne Armstrong, and Denny Patterson, teenager saw a strange creature rear up at them off the ground directly in front of them. 
It had glowing green eyes, and no arms were visible. The creature left strange tracks at the sight which resembled the footgear worn by skin divers. On to the next one. In Portage County in Ohio, this was near Aurora, I rode my bike into the Audubon Wildlife Area. I was 10 or 11 years old, I guess, and as I entered, I saw a strange man walking south toward the road, Pioneer Trail, maybe 50 yards from me. I do not remember seeing the lower half of the body. After a short while, I realized this was not a man. I remember reddish appearing hair. I became frightened and left quickly. I do not remember any other details about this animal's appearance and had no idea of what I saw at the time. Bigfoot was an unknown concept to me. In fact, I never associated the experience with Bigfoot until recently. It was at 2 p.m. and with clear weather. It was a forested area with a stream and a swamp. On to the next one. In a rural area, about two miles outside of the town in Ashland County in Ohio, it was on an old hickory road. This incident occurred about 40 years ago, but I'm going to relate what happened anyway. Two other teenage neighbors and I were sitting in a large yard in a rural setting one September evening talking. All of a sudden, the property owner's dog ran from behind the barn yelping. Our approximate sitting position in relation to the dog was, I'd say, about 70 to 80 feet. What surprised us initially was that this big boxer dog was afraid of nothing. The three of us turned in unison to see a large creature come from behind the barn that I would describe as resembling part bear, part ape, and part human. It was about seven feet tall, and it had rather long, dirty, reddish-brown hair. I would best describe the creature's gait as a fast lope. What I mean is that it would bring its right leg to its left and repeat the same movement in a quick manner while swinging its arms in a fully extended and relaxed manner kind of difficult to describe. It moved from our left to our right. It loped across the yard, across the road, and into the wood. It was the time of evening that it was starting to get dark. I said to the two other boys, let's get knives and flashlights and investigate. When we had assembled the gear, we followed the creature's path to the edge of the wood. Although we were young and full of bravado, we weren't brave enough to actually go into the wood. We instead shined our flashlight in the wood from a safe distance. We could see in the light's reflection two bright pink eyes looking back at us. Well, what little bravado that we had evaporated and we ran home. Although this event occurred about 40 years ago, I can still see it in my mind as though it happened yesterday. It was a warm, clear summer evening, dusk, but still somewhat light. It was rural farmland with mixed forest. On to the next one. In West Cincinnati, in Hamilton County in Ohio, Miss Rose lived in a trailer court and got out from her bed to get a drink of water. There was an intense light coming through the windows that attracted her attention, and Miss Rose opened the curtain. She saw a row of six individual lights forming an arc six feet from her window that were a silvery blue color, self-luminous, and hovering four feet off the ground. No light was cast on the ground below, though. Miss Rose then saw another light further out over the car park that resembled a seven-foot-tall, bell-shaped vessel, and, to her amazement, she saw an ape-like creature inside of it. The light moved to the rear of a parked car, as if doing something to it. Miss Rose then dashed into her 13-year-old son Carl's bedroom. The creature was standing in the light 35 feet from the car, 
and she could see that it was gray in color and looking at a warehouse building. The face was featureless, except for a downward sloping snout, and it had no neck. The man-beast's arms were moving up and down stiffly, and the elbows never bent. It looked like a hairy robot. Miss Rose phoned the police and heard a loud boom noise when the UFO took off. On to the next one. In Hamilton County, near Cincinnati, Ohio, Mr. Wallace Wright, his girlfriend, and several men saw a very tall creature like a huge tree walking. Originally, it was only the young couple who were in the car at the time that saw the creature, but they went and got the other witnesses who also saw it. On to the next one. In Manfield in Richard County, Ohio, Mr. C.W. Cox and many other independent witnesses saw a seven to eight foot tall hairy humanoid that looked like a gorilla with gray hair and glowing green eyes. The creature had been previously seen here before. It was not a bear. On to the next one. I had my first and only Sasquatch sighting when I was 13 years old. It was a tradition for my family to stay with my Grandma Jane up in Idaho for a few weeks each summer. This particular year, my older brother Charlie was heading into his junior year of high school with the hopes of being considered for a college football scholarship. It had been a known thing among our family for a while that he was going to take the next two seasons very seriously and that he wanted to be around campus all summer to train. Because of that, our family decided to do something different and spent a long weekend with Grandma Jane in the spring. We usually saw her during other holidays, but this was usually the one trip throughout the year where we stayed at her house for an extended period. Unfortunately, my boyfriend had just dumped me, and things felt gloomy as ever. I loved Grandma Jane very much, so I tried my best to hide those feelings from her, but she saw right through the act. It's sort of funny how we think we're better at concealing certain things than we really are when we're going through adolescence. Grandma Jane caught me sniffling on more than one occasion. She was very empathetic explaining that she also went through a handful of rough relationships back when she was around my age. She explained how certain things feel monumental as we're going through them, but later in life, we're able to chuckle at how trivial they were. She wasn't explaining that as a way of disregarding my current feelings, but instead she wanted me to know that I wasn't going to feel that way forever. She claimed that we needed to experience those challenging times to become more proficient at finding the person we can form a lasting mutual connection with. I had always deeply respected Grandma Jane, though her words were encouraging. Still, I kept finding it incredibly hard to shake that feeling of rejection. Grandma Jane had a routine where she would go for a walk by herself every day. She was very active and loved to spend as much time as she could outdoors. Even though she was happy to go for walks with us while we visited, she still insisted on getting her daily solo walk. I remember her saying something about how she needed it to preserve her peace of mind. Nobody ever even knew where she went during the solo walks, and nobody ever seemed to care much to find out since Grandma Jane would usually set off for these walks between 5 and 6 in the morning. Because of how much she seemed to savor this private routine, I was beyond blown away when she asked if I wanted to join her. It's interesting how such seemingly small things can seem so much more significant depending on the circumstances. If I remember correctly, it was our last full day in Idaho when Grandma came into my room and woke me up. She already had on her hiking boots and a jacket. 
It was still dark outside, but she seemed overly eager to get moving. I think I just assumed she was worried about missing the sunrise, which was known to be breathtakingly beautiful out there. There were many gravel streets around her residence, so I had assumed she mostly stuck to walking those. I was pretty surprised when she walked underneath what seemed like a random tree branch about 15 minutes or so from her house. After she ducked her head and walked beneath it, she pulled it up a bit and told me to head on through. I noticed Grandma Jane had gotten quieter as soon as we entered the narrow wooded path, but I figured it was because we were about to walk by someone's home and didn't want them to think that someone was trespassing. By this point, I was pretty curious about where we were headed, but when I'd ask her for an explanation, she would shush me. Eventually, faint sunlight began to pierce the narrow, dark path before us, and I soon laid eyes upon an enormous basin that looked like it once must have hosted a large river. In a way, it kind of looked like a much smaller version of the Grand Canyon. There was something about the texture and color of the mountainous walls that reminded me of it. Take a seat, Grandma Jane said at a still hushed volume after I followed her over to a couple of chopped tree stumps neatly positioned next to one another. Your grandfather and I used to come here quite a bit, she said, as we sat there looking at the rising sun. This is where he proposed to me. He carved the seat you're sitting on for that very occasion. Wow, I remarked, realizing that I was the only other family member to have been invited to such a magical location. Grandpa John died almost seven years before then, and although it seemed like a lifetime ago for me, it probably felt like yesterday for Grandma Jane. I can see why the two of you came here so often, I said, admiring the sky that began to resemble a pastel painting. Oh, you haven't seen anything yet, Grandma Jane said with a mysterious tone, yet I still assumed she was referring to the consistently evolving sunrise. I want you to promise me something, Grandma Jane added a few moments later. What's that? I asked. Well, a couple of things actually, Grandma Jane said. The first thing I would like for you to promise is that you'll always keep an open mind. The challenges of life make it far too easy to become cynical and closed-minded. And I would be grateful if you could do whatever it takes to keep that in check. Do you promise? Uh, sure, Grandma, I promise, I said, genuinely having no idea where she was going with any of this. The next thing I want you to promise is that you'll never tell anyone about this location or what you saw here today. I'm about to show you something that very few people get to experience, but humans tend to exploit when they're given opportunities to make lots of money. If rumors were to spread about what goes on here, all the beautiful land you see before you could get ruined. Does that make sense? I suppose so, I said, my confusion growing by the second. When life gets tough, we need to remember that there are miracles beyond our wildest imagination occurring around every corner, Grandma said. There's so much more to this world than we can even begin to understand. A situation that feels like the end of the world on one day can easily get overtaken by something the next day. Therefore, we should always keep our eyes open and remain receptive to new things in life. Otherwise, we might miss some of the magic, and that would be a tragedy. By that point, I think I just nodded at everything Grandma Jane said, pretending to take in all her words of wisdom. It seemed like she had brought me here to her secret spot for a mere pep talk and a beautiful sunrise. I sincerely appreciated her intentions, but if that were the extent of her strategy to steer my mind elsewhere, it wouldn't have been very effective. They should be coming around any moment now, Grandma said again lowering the volume of her voice. Huh? Who's coming around? I said, glancing all around us. She didn't respond right away, but I noticed she kept her gaze on the basin below rather than the rising sun. Who on earth was she expecting? 
I saw she glimpsed her wristwatch right before I spotted what I thought were a couple of brown bears entering my view from the right at the bottom of the basin. The only reason my mind assumed they were bears was that they were covered in fur from head to toe. It only took a handful of seconds to acknowledge that bears don't walk as these things did. I soon found myself desperate to know what these animals were, but I couldn't get the word out to Grandma Jane. I was much too spellbound by the scene, especially when three more of the same type of animal came into view. Even though they were far beneath us, I could see that two of them were each carrying a dead deer. Shortly after that, more of the odd-looking animals appeared, some of which took a few strides on all fours, seemingly analyzing the terrain beneath them. Suddenly, I began to feel like I was more so observing a tribe of prehistoric hominids rather than a pack of animals. It was kind of like my perception quickly bounced back and forth between the two, indecisive about how to categorize them. I fully understand what other people mean when they say these creatures are unique to anything else they've ever seen. They certainly don't align with the things we've learned in school. If Grandma Jane knew that the clan would appear around that time, that indicated that she saw them regularly. How would anyone else, aside from my deceased grandfather, not have known about their presence? After looking around more thoroughly, I realized that there were no houses anywhere in sight. There was never a moment where the whole clan was in view due to occasional overhanging trees, but if I recall correctly, there were nine of them walking along the bottom of that basin. It could have been because they were too far off, but I never heard them make a peep. The surprise of it all made the scene feel like it lasted a lifetime, but the clan was probably visible to the two of us for less than a minute. Eventually, they made their way to around a bend, and that was it. I knew it was over just from the notion that Grandma Jane returned to speaking at a casual volume. I know, I know, she said softly, more than understanding of my awe and inability to vocalize it. Your grandfather showed them to me many, many years ago. It was the reason he used to come here before we met. He loved me and was eager to show me the phenomenon, but he expressed that he needed to feel certain I wouldn't make a big deal about it and tell others. Your Grandpa John was a deep admirer of the natural world, and he would never be able to endure the guilt from disrespecting it. Those words made a lot more sense to me later on when I learned that many Native Americans are very aware that Sasquatch exists. Grandpa John had Native American roots on his mother's side, and it turned out he was taught to respect the Sasquatch from a very early age. Grandma Jane said it seemed that his ancestors perceived the creatures as forest spirits, though she clarified that didn't mean they weren't considered dangerous. She said they could be somewhat territorial and even consume human meat when their preferred food source numbers are dwindling. That was the sort of thing I wish she had waited until we were back inside her house to tell me. But... Her relaxed demeanor helped me stay somewhat calm. I kept looking over my shoulder and jumping after every little noise along our walk back home. My mom was up and brewing coffee when we entered the house. If she noticed that I was acting strange, she probably figured it was because I was still hung up on getting dumped. If anyone asked what was up with me, I would have just continued to use that whole thing as my excuse. It was probably a week or two after we returned home to Missouri that I realized Grandma's supposed strategy had worked. My mind was so consumed with amazement over the Sasquatch that I barely thought about my recent breakup. It was sort of like the experience kicked those feelings of intense sadness to the curb. Honestly, it was darn difficult not to tell anyone else I knew about all of this but my conscience told me not to betray my grandmother's wishes. I understood that she put a lot of faith into trusting me with her secret, and I'm sure she wanted to keep it on the down low as a tribute to Grandpa John. Coincidentally, 
Grandma Jane died in her sleep less than a year later, but because she was so active and health conscious, we all thought she had many years left in her, but it turned out she had a rare heart condition. I have spontaneously thought about going back to that place to see if the creatures still move through there, but fear ultimately gets the best of me. I think I'd probably be fine, but there's a tiny part of me that wonders whether my solo presence might somehow throw them off. How do I know for sure that they wouldn't see my random appearance as a potential threat, even though I never caught any of the creatures glaring at us? I would find it hard to believe that they weren't aware of us. We were high above them, but we definitely weren't hiding. I'm sure Grandma Jane and I would have duck out like a couple of sore thumbs to wild and intelligent beings, but I suspect they must have grown accustomed to both my grandparents long before then. I have to say that it felt excellent to write this whole thing down finally. I now can't believe I never thought to do it before. I had been so preoccupied with trying not to betray Grandma Jane that I failed to recognize I could share my experience while withholding details that would give away the location. I often think about how many other people there could be out there that might have daily routines similar to my grandparents. It also makes me suspect there must be a government-employed scientist studying these creatures behind closed doors. It seems foolish to believe that my grandparents and I were some of the only people to keep it a secret like this. I now believe there are many things in this world that will never get the chance to see or fully understand. On to the next one. In 1962, my family was living in the outskirts of Toronto, Canada. We regularly hunted and fished in many locations in the provinces. One of our favorite locations was the Shenango Lake area, north of Foyle This was one of our best locations for fishing walleye, perch, and northern. However, this time around, it was for a moose hunt. The trip was a 450-mile run by car to train station where we climbed aboard the Canadian National Railway with our gear. The train stopped at our destination, where we hooked up with a camp owner who brought us our accommodations for the week. This entire region was loaded with outlying lakes and beautiful timber, which was the perfect habitat for moose. When we fished here, we typically rented a motorboat. We would regularly see moose foraging by the side of the lake. Many times, we would see them enter into the lake to eat bottom vegetation. This trip, however, was to be taken on foot with two different guides. My father and I went with Pierre, and my uncle was with a guy named Rolf. For me, the plan was to spend alternating days with either my uncle or my dad. Both of our guides were using what is known as a bugle. I don't recall exactly what it was, but my recollection was that of a large animal horn of some type. It actually required some skill and expertise to produce the proper sound when blowing into it. But when it was done right, it would call the moose into the location where you were. It was on the third day of the trip that we had hiked up to Lay Lake in hope of finding some larger moose. On that day, it was to be my dad and me working the southern tip of the lake, while my uncle and Rolf worked on the northern end of the lake. We were seeing moose, but according to the guide, there were larger bulls that were well worth the extra effort of finding, and so we followed their lead. My dad didn't talk much about the money, but at the time, I knew it was costing them a pretty penny to be here. I was happy they had spent it, we spent the entire day working the edges of Lake Lay and had once again passed on what I thought were some really decent-looking bulls. It was on day four that we were hiking north up an old logging road with our destination being Frank Lake. My father and Pierre had split off from us to continue on to Frank Lake and we were going with Rolf northwest to Rocky Lake. Our plan for today was to divide and conquer. At least 
that what Rolf had said. When we were closing in on the southern end of Rocky Lake, Rolf had said quietly that he had heard something. He said that we were going to sit tight where we were and start calling. It was amazing to me what these professionals were capable of in the woods. I say this because my uncle and I had heard nothing. Rolf had started bugling in the usual fashion. After about 30 minutes or so, we started to hear some loud crashing and crunching in the woods, and he just smiled. It sounded like an elephant was smashing its way through the timber, and we were smiling from ear to ear in anticipation of seeing the beast that was capable of making such a commotion. Over the past three days, we had heard nothing like this, and we had seen many really large moose. Whatever this was, that was responding to the bugle had to be of immense proportion, and yet we hadn't seen anything as of yet. Suddenly, everything went silent, and I could tell by the facial expression which Rolf was making that he was puzzled over the sudden stoppage of movement in the timber. It remained as was for about twenty minutes. As Rolf continued to bugle intermittently, it was then that we heard what sounded like a tree thrashing about ahead of us that was accompanied by some very deep, guttural grunting sound. The sound was unlike anything we had heard in the previous days being made by the moose, and yet we still had not seen anything. Now, everything I'm about to say from here on out had happened very quickly. All of our attention had been drawn to looking at and listening to this commotion that was coming from directly in front of us. Prior to the silence, when suddenly my uncle had turned to his left and whispered, Oh my God, what is that? We all turned to behold an enormous ape-like creature that was standing at the fringes of the timber, parting some low brush with its hands to look at us. We heard nothing coming from this side whatsoever up to the point when my uncle said, Oh my God, this gorilla or monster must have been 12 feet tall and stood there, staring us down while rocking from side to side. It seemed to have no fear of us whatsoever, and maintained its position as we did also. Rolf had chambered around and held his gun at the ready in the direction of the monster. I don't know why he didn't shoot, but he held his gun in a way that I thought he was going to. No sooner had he raised his gun than did the beast retreat into the trees and we could hear nothing. What surprised us all was that something so large could sneak up on us and retreat with such stealth. It was after about five minutes that the wood in front of us erupted with the sound of thrashing and crashing once again. As soon as the noise subsided, a roar of immense volume came out of the trees. It was so loud it made my cheek quiver. I can tell you right now that at the time, I was scared to death. What we had seen was so large and formidable, a creature that I thought it could kill us with or without gun. The roar went on for about 20 seconds and then stopped. It was then that Rolf said, it's time to go. We started to make our way out the way we had come in. The whole time, we could hear activity in the timber to our left-hand side. This beast was following us. My uncle and Rolf were both holding their guns in a way that indicated they were ready to shoot, if need be, at any time. We were about a mile away from where we had parted ways with my dad and Pierre, and about halfway through the hike, when the noises to our left, to our left had ceased, we were almost at the fork where we had split up, when my dad and Pierre appeared, walking in our direction. As we met up, they said we were coming to help. We heard the roar and thought you might be in trouble, but there were no gunshots. We started to explain to them all that had happened from hearing the trees and the rustling to seeing the monster standing near to us. Pierre started asking Rolf about the nature of what we had encountered. Being puzzled by what we were saying, he had thought we may have encountered a large bear. Rolf had told him it was a huge, hair-covered monster similar to a man and an ape in one being. He described it as being well over four meters tall 
and perhaps two meters at the shoulder. Its body appeared to be extremely muscular, as was evidenced by its ability to shake large trees. Rolf told them it had extremely large hands and dark skin with black dead man's eyes, as he called them. Pierre then said it sounded like we had encountered the hairy man of the wood. Never had either of them encountered such a creature before, although they were both in agreement that they now knew what the roars were, having heard them before many times. The hands on this monster hung at knee level, and its upper thighs were about 15 inches broad from a frontal view. The upper torso formed a perfect V-shape from the waist up. Its nose was broad and flat with hair coming into both sides of the face, as well as hanging from the chin like a ragged beard. The most horrific part of the entire encounter was when the roar emanated through the trees. The beak couldn't have been more than a hundred feet away when it erupted into the screaming roar. As it went on, I felt as though it was damaging me. It was actually penetrating my body in a way that made me think my heart was going to stop. I can't explain to you in any other way than it was absolutely terrifying in every sense of the word. We ended our trip by tagging out down near the camp, having seen nor heard anything more of this hideous beast. On to the next one. During the summer of 1949, the Alton neighborhood of Gooseville, named after a cluster of half-dozen homes where geese were raised, served as a monster epicenter of Illinois. The peacefulness of August was shattered by a large bear-like creature that spread tremendous fear through the area. The first to see it reported that it was some sort of large, brown, shaggy furred beast that resembled a bear. Simple sightings quickly turned deadly when farmer Lloyd Pruett discovered one of his livestock had been mangled by the unknown beast, which completely devoured the young calf's head. Like many people, seeing equals believing, and the old adage certainly rang true for Pruett, who told the Mount Vernon Register, I laughed when I first heard there was a vicious animal around here earlier this week, but I'm not laughing now. Pruitt also claimed to have found large bear tracks near the calf's mangled carcass. Another nearby farmer reported that the beast had savagely slaughtered several of his sheep. In the first week alone, six different sightings of the beast were reported. Fear of the lethal monster was rapidly spreading. The Ogden Standard reported that farm work in Gooseville area ceased abruptly at sundown and children are hustled indoors. The Traverse City Record Eagle wrote, The report has terrorized the little town. Farmers keep their shotgun handy as they work in the field. Mothers hustle their children indoors quickly at sundown. 18-year-old Kenneth stumbled upon what looked like a shaggy brown bear fighting with a dog. But I didn't stay around to see the fight. Later that day, a farmer discovered the dog's mangled body adding yet one more victim to the monster's ever-growing kill list. Finally, the townsfolk decided that enough was enough, and on the evening of August 10th, an angry posse of 150 grim farmers gathered along the brush near Indian Creek. The hunt was led by Henry Gerd, a state conservationist, commissioner, supervisor, and mayor of the nearby town of Bethalto. To ensure that none of the hunters would be accidentally killed, only the use of shotguns were permitted, and no one under the age of 21 was allowed to join the hunt. The posse divided up into seven groups, making their way through the entire valley. The Daily Chronicle followed the hunt and reported that the hunters had found tracks at least 18 inches long, and although the hunters caught no sight of the monster, their trek through the valley netted them exactly two dead raccoons, one dead possum. Henry was undeterred by the failed effort, claiming the bear or whatever it is outsmarted us. But we found enough evidence to convince me that it actually exists. We're not giving up. We'll be back with more men and hound dogs the next time he sighted. A mere three days after the failed posse hunt, 
L. E. Whitther, a farmer on the north end of Alton, spotted the monster moving along through a cornfield and fired off two shots at it. Believing that the second shot had hit the beast, the man decided to pursue the wounded animal. Now, here is where the story gets really weird, at least weirder than a man blasting away at an unknown monster, because, according to the Mount Vernon Register News, Schwitzer was accompanied by a pet monkey, a cocker spaniel, a poodle, and a Norwegian elk hound. As the menagerie of man and pet gave chase, animal instinct or something told them to make haste in the general direction of the house. Once back at the safety of their house, the Cocker Spaniel was still exhibiting signs of fear and spent the next two hours cowering under a wash rack before it was coaxed out. Picking up on the weirdness of this scenario, the newspaper ended the article by explaining that the monkey was simply a summer boarder at the Switzer farm. News of the Gustav monster had now spread across the entire county. Looking to capitalize on some free publicity, the Canadian Fur Company even offered a $350 reward to anyone who could bring in the monster's pelt. With both the organized posse and lone farmers failing to bag the monster, perhaps it was time for a professional hunter to get in on the monster's circus that was consuming the area. Captain Hassault Dias, an explorer of Africa, confidently announced that he would travel to Gooseville and trap the monster just as he had successfully done with the mighty gorilla. Yet, catching an unknown monster proved to be much harder for the captain than simply making boisterous claims, and as November rolled around, he abruptly called off his hunt. The captain told the United Press, I am through with monsters, believing that fantastical stories of a prehistoric cattle-devouring carnivore was a hope. However, the captain had no reason to hang his head because no one was ever able to bag the beast. Even though an occasional report would trickle in every couple of years, most believed the monster had left the area. On to the next one. To this day, I can't say for certain exactly what it was, but I know it had bitter, evil intention. I've been born and raised close to a round Ann Harbor in Michigan. My entire life, I have never encountered anything weird or out of the ordinary. I am an avid hiker and outdoorsman and have seen it all when it comes to wildlife. I know much of my teenage years and early 20s was riddled with tales of the supposed dogman that lives out in the wilderness. But I had never encountered such a thing, or at least I thought, until more recently. This happened to me a month ago. I'm still having a hard time processing what happened. I usually like to hike and traverse through miles and miles of wilderness. As I'm hiking through the woods, I just have this odd feeling that I'm being watched, and it's making me more and more uncomfortable as I go on. I continuously look around and check my surroundings, but I don't see anything. After a short amount of time, maybe not even a half hour later, the woods start to go silent. Now, for those of you who aren't outdoorsmen, this usually happens when there is an alpha predator in the area. The only thing I can think of would be a black bear, which is the only kind of bear there is in Michigan. But I seriously doubt a black bear would be stalking me like this. I've also dealt with black bear in the past. I've never had an experience anywhere close to what I was having with any black bear. I continued to track on back to my truck, having only gone about three miles into the wood, and that's when I start to smell a sickly sweet smell. It smells like death, rotting meat, and wet dog, and it was strong. At this point, I start picking up the pace and jogging back to my truck. I knew whatever I was smelling 
couldn't be too far away. And as soon as I started jogging, I could hear this thing start keeping up pace with me. It couldn't have been more than 20 yards behind me. I pretty much refused to turn around and look. And I literally kept my pace all the way until I made it to the tree line and ran to my truck and got the hell out of there. What's weird and also scares me at that same time is that whenever this was, I'm sure it could have easily gotten me and taken me out, but it didn't. It just kept pace with me, like it was trying to shoo me off its territory. It's really going to affect everything now, from the way I hike to where I hike. I guess there are just some things in the wilderness we were never meant to discover. On to the next one. The story I'm about to tell happened when I was 15 years old. It was shocking and so terrifying that it changed my life forever, and the memory of it still lives in me as if it happened just yesterday. It was the third week of August, 1985. School would be starting soon, and I was training for a 10K race that was held every year for a festival in town. I remember it was a hot August day with the temperatures pushing close to 100 degrees. I was supposed to run five miles, but due to the high temperatures, I put off my run until evening. Running at night wasn't a big deal to me. I grew up on a farm in the country and wasn't scared of the dark. Often during my childhood, I ran around at night, racing through cornfields, playing hide and seek, you name it. I was outside no matter the hour. So the concept of going for a long run down a country road in the dark wasn't something I was fearful of. I had my route planned. I'd leave my house, run down the ditch of State Route 4 for about 300 yards until I reached Temple Road, which dead-ended into it. From there, I'd run down Temple Road until it intersected with State Route 98. This was the halfway mark, so from there, the plan was to turn around and just come back. Night came, and it was around 10 o'clock, and I headed out. There was enough moonlight to see, but it definitely wasn't a full moon. I got to the halfway mark at State Route 98, turned around, and started heading back. There wasn't much along Temple Road, just cornfields on one side and soybeans on the other, with small pockets of trees dotting the landscape and only a couple of farmhouses along the stretch of the road back then. I was more than halfway done my run, and it was going great. I was closing in on a crossroad, which meant I was only about a mile out from Route 4. On my left, there was a pocket of trees, then the crossroad, which was Flickinger Road, and on the other side of that, a cornfield that stretched a mile all the way to Route 4. On my right, just after the crossroad, was a field of soybeans, which too stretched out a mile. It was at the wooded area where I sensed something was wrong. I don't know how to say it, but I just felt like something was off. It was enough of a feeling that I stopped running. The warm evening air felt a bit cool against my hot skin, and as I stood, taking in deep breaths and looking around, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. Movement suddenly came from the cornfield near the crossroad. I snapped my head in the direction of the sound and looked, but with the corn standing about six feet tall, I couldn't see anyone or anything. More sounds of movement came. This time, I saw the corn moving, and I could tell by how many stalks were being disturbed 
that whatever it was, it was big. This instantly jolted me with fear, but only because I wasn't expecting to hear something while on my run. My first instinct was to assume it was a deer. And why? Because we had a huge deer population in Ohio, and I couldn't imagine it was anything else. I pushed aside my initial fear and began to run again. Whatever was in the corn also began to run. What was odd was whatever was there was not running towards me, but was running with me, like through the corn and keeping pace with me. When I say pace, I mean it was running at my exact pace. I looked over at the corn and saw that whatever was running alongside me was about four rows in from the edge of the field, making it impossible to see what it could be. I stopped again, turned, and looked, hoping to catch a glimpse but only grew more fearful as it too stopped the very second I did. I strained to see what it could be, but it wasn't moving an inch and was very quiet. I knew then this wasn't the usual behavior for a deer. The air around me was still, not a breeze of any kind, but the feeling, oh, the feeling was thick with a scent of dread. In the back of my mind, I knew deer didn't act like this, but I assumed it had to be a deer, although a very odd one, because what else could it be? Hoping to spook it, I hollered out, but nothing happened. Unsure what else to do, I took off running again, and sure enough, it ran too. Freaked that it was again pacing me, I stopped and it stopped. I was beyond concerned. I was terrified. My adrenaline was pumping, and my mind was spinning about what it could be. By the amount of corn I saw moving when it was pacing me, it had to be bigger than a dog or coyote. And I knew there weren't bears in this part of Ohio. As I went through a list of animals large enough to make such a disturbance in the corn, only to come up with nothing, I began to tremble. My heart pounded, and the intense dread I felt was enough to make anyone go crazy. I was alone, engulfed by the dark of night, and something large was in the corn. I didn't know what it was or what was going on, but I did know that I wanted to get as far away from it as I could. I knew that I had three quarters of a mile to go until I got to Route 4, and then a short few hundred yards to my house beyond that. I didn't know what else to do except keep running. But if I did, whatever it was would only keep pacing me. This meant I needed to change it up. I needed to not just run. I needed to run as fast as I could. I had to give it all I had. I was confident in my abilities as I was a good runner and really fast. As I inhaled several deep breaths, I concocted a plan to sprint about three to four hundred yards. Enough, I thought, to outpace and eventually put some distance between me and whatever was in the corn still being eerily still and quiet. I figured there was no way this thing could see me because I couldn't see it. And with the fully grown corn being an obstacle, it would have a difficult time keeping up, or so I thought. I began a countdown in my head. As I ticked down, I readied myself for what felt at that moment like the run of my life. I bent slightly at the hip, leaned in, and tensed my body. Ready. Set. Go. I took off like I was being shot from a cannon. For a split second, 
I felt like I'd be able to outrun this thing. But then I heard it. Like the two other times it was pacing me. Whatever the thing was, it was keeping up with me even though it had to blast through the corn to do so. I dug deeper and pushed harder. My pace increased, but it wasn't any good, as it kept matching mine. If I went faster, it went faster. I could feel my heart pumping hard and fast. I was giving all I had, but it wasn't enough. I covered about 300 yards, and I could feel I was done, gassed, out of steam. Unable to keep going, I stopped, and like before, it stopped too. Now, I came to the horrifying conclusion that whatever was in the corn was not only faster than me, but there was no way it was a person. There was then, and still is now, no one who could run through the corn like it had. I don't care if you brought in an Olympic track star, they'd not be able to do it. It was impossible. I stood in the road, a deep feeling of defeat washed over my trembling body. I had totally spent all my energy to get away from the thing, and I'd failed. I took my eyes off the corn and stared down the long stretch of road that I still needed to cover. I was scared, alone, and still had a good half mile to go in order to reach Route 4. The only thing close to me was an old abandoned farmhouse about a hundred yards down the road to my right. I recalled there had been an old tree in the front yard and quickly adjusted my plan. What I'd do now was carefully make my way there, climb it to the top, and wait until morning. Armed with this new plan, I made my way slowly toward the tree. With every step I took, this thing moved too. I made it to the tree, and the second I looked at it, my heart sank. As there was nothing to grab a hold of, as the tree had been dehorned, I couldn't climb the tree. It was impossible, and once more, I felt defeated. As I stood, staring at the tree, a terrifying realization came to me. Even if I made it the next half mile to Route 4, I'd have to turn left and possibly cross paths with whatever was there. I imagined making the turn and it, whatever it was, would come out and get me. I immediately pushed the fear out of my mind and focused on what I'd do next. I wasn't done yet. I wasn't going to just give up. I needed to keep going. But with going left not an option, I decided I needed to go right, and that's when it hit me. My good friend lived off Route 4, but in the opposite direction, which meant all I needed to do was make it to Route 4, turn right, and race down about 150 yards. I thought about making a run for his house across the soybeans, but quickly dismissed the idea as I feared I'd get tangled up in the soybean plant. No, I needed to keep pressing forward down Temple Road, but this time I'd go slow to conserve my energy for what I hoped would be my grand finale, a 150-yard sprint to my buddy's house. Not wasting another second in thought, I pivoted and began my long march toward the intersection of Route 4. Each step I took, was matched by the thing in the corn. In my mind, a flurry of questions were flying around. Is this thing baiting me? Is it stalking me? Is it just messing with me? I didn't know what to think. All I knew was it still hadn't come out. But that fact didn't give me peace of mind because at any moment it could. And there was not a doubt in my mind that if it did, I'd be dead. Route 4 came into view as a car barreled down it. The headlights illuminated the area for a brief moment. I readied myself for what I knew would be the run of my life, literally. More questions entered my already troubled mind. Would I look over my shoulder and see it? 
Did I want to look over my shoulder? Would it give chase? What was it? If I looked back, would doing so slow me down? Or would looking back and seeing something awful scare me to the point that I'd freeze? In a snap decision, I decided that when I took off, I wouldn't look back. I'd just hammer out the run and hope that it didn't come after me. With less than 20 feet to go to the intersection, I picked up my pace and, of course, it matched me. I looked to my right, over the rows of soybeans, and didn't see any traffic. I craned my head to the left and saw a glow of lights shining over the top of the corn. A car was coming, and it posed me with another issue. Do I stop and wait, or do I just make my move? I threw all caution to the wind and took off at full speed like I was coming out of the starting block for a hundred meter dash. I cleared where the corn ended on my left, which allowed me to see Route 4 clearly. Down the road, I spied a truck, but it was far away enough for me to safely cross. I had sworn that I wouldn't look back, but I couldn't resist. I craned my head over my shoulder, and right at that moment, I saw something exit the corn and stop. I can't recall how long I looked at it but it was long enough to get a good look. And all I can say is the first thing that came to mind was the Egyptian god Anubis. I had no other frame of reference back then, nor was I aware of dogmen, much less Bigfoot. All I knew was it walked out upright on two legs and stood about six to seven feet tall. I could judge its height because its head was taller than the corn. It had a well-defined canine head, dark hair, and its build was similar to that of a greyhound, lean and muscular. It stood with its body postured like it was in a stance and its shoulders rolled forward. At the time, it reminded me how a linebacker stands ready for the ball to be snapped. It turned its head and looked at me. By its stance and long arms positioned out in front of it, I presumed it was readying itself to pursue me. I faced forward and gave it all I had. I cleared a hundred yards with ease, cut across one yard, and came up on the boundary of my buddy's backyard. In front of me was a chain-link fence, and I prayed the gate was open. But as I drew closer, I saw it was closed and most likely locked. I decided in an instant I would jump the fence. Now, the fence wasn't too tall, but it was tall enough for me not to be able to hurdle it. I reached it, grabbed hold of the top, which was just exposed and jagged metal, and threw myself over. As I flew over, a sharp edge of the fence gouged my side, but I didn't let it slow me down. I landed on the other side and could now see the swimming pool in front of me. I made a split-second decision and dove in, not thinking it was the shallow end. My chest hit the bottom and I slid down to the deep end, which was about 10 feet. I rolled onto my back, exhaled all my air, pinched my nose, and looked up. I lay there, my body screaming with pain as my eyes darted around, looking for it to walk up and stare down on me in the pool. What must have been 30 seconds went by nothing showed up. No towering figure, no shadows cast down on me in the pool. Had I made it? Did it not follow me? Unable to hold my breath any longer, I swam to the surface, quickly looked around, but didn't see it anywhere. I swam to the edge and crawled out. Frantic, I raced to the back sliding door of the house. I didn't know if it was locked or not. I grabbed the handle and pulled. The door flew open. I stepped through the vertical blinds that had been closed for privacy and into the house. What I didn't know was his parents were out of town and what he wasn't expecting was anyone to suddenly appear, yet here I was. My buddy jumped from his chair when I entered the living room. He wasn't just shocked to see me. He was also a bit embarrassed as he'd been watching the Playboy channel. 
He peppered me with many questions, all of which I answered as best I could between heavy breath. I finally regained my composure and told him what had happened and what I'd seen. At first, he doubted me, assuming I'd seen something like a deer. I wouldn't waver. I knew what I'd seen. I knew what had just happened. Eventually, he came around, and when he did, he too became scared. After agreeing for me to stay the night, we locked all the doors and turned the lights out. The rest of the evening was spent walking around his house and peering out of the window, half expecting to see the dog man lurking about outside. The morning came and brought a sense of calm and relief. I had survived whatever that was I had seen, and I couldn't be happier. My buddy took me home, and I immediately told my father what had occurred. I didn't know what to expect from him, but he quickly dismissed my story. He told me that because I had gotten spooked, that my mind had played tricks on me. Like I did with my buddy, I stood my ground and told him I knew what I had seen and that I hadn't imagined it. What's interesting, though, about my dad was that after my encounter, he never went outside at night without tucking a thirty-eight caliber pistol into the back of his pants. That told me all I needed to know. He did believe me, but by admitting it, he probably thought it would have scared me more than I already was. I chalked up his dismissal as a way of him protecting me. Much time has separated me from that night, but the fear that still remains in many ways. I've never run that stretch of road since, even during the daytime. I've also never ran again at night anywhere. I still live in the area, and no matter when I venture out at night, I usually have a weapon with me, and I'm always on alert. Years later, I became aware of the term dogman, and upon doing some research, I have no doubt that what I encountered that night was just that. I'm not afraid to tell anyone about what happened to me that night. I know what happened, and I know what I saw. My openness and transparency has no doubt resulted in some rolling their eyes or thinking that I imagined it, but I have met others who believe. These believers have showered me with their theories of that night. Some say that a dogman has a trait of a canine, those being that they run and hunt in a pack. They pointed out that maybe the one that paced me was simply driving me to the others that were waiting. This thought has, and still, sends chills down my spine. What if I had decided to make a run for my house? Would the one that exited the corn have given chase, or were there others just on the other side of the road in the cornfield? I'll never know, but it gives me pause. I still don't know why it never came out of the corn before Route 4. Was it just toying with me? I have replayed that night over and over again, and each time I imagine it coming after me, and what follows is my demise. It was faster than me, appeared much stronger, and without a doubt could have run me down and killed me, and yet it didn't. Again, I don't know why it never came after me. I'm just happy that it didn't. To those who may doubt the existence of a dogman, I can tell you that they exist and there is plenty of open and remote land for them to call home. Those who scoff at a story like mine, I say that history has shown us many tales of strange creatures only for those creatures to eventually be discovered decades later by the scientific community. For me, it's only a matter of when, not if, dogmen are scientifically proven to exist. But if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, that's fine. I know what I experienced that night, and I know what I saw as it seared into my memory. So, as a warning to those of you who are listening, dogmen are out there. 
And if you're ever thinking of running late at night on Temple Road, don't. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!